dressing and repositioning the body. So you all are reacting to this, especially I'm sure the the um, the licensees, if you will, the regulators on the line here today, but you're also a licensee, so you have knowledge now to start to ask yourself, is this within the scope of practice? So the first issue we are going to think about is, well, who's responsible for interpreting that scope of practice? And, and when I say scope, just to be clear, especially for the new regulators on the line, is the scope of practice is going to be in the statute itself. It will be defined, and you all as the regulators, as the board itself, are responsible for interpreting that scope of practice. You bring the expertise and public members to the table to, as a group, determine how to interpret that scope of practice. Now, that interpretation might be challenged uh, in the courts, as would perhaps the, it in this case itself as well, and or ultimately will be challenged. But that is your role. Now, this takes us all the way back to the deference question. If you interpret something like you're reading on the screen now to be within the scope of practice, and someone challenges this, and it gets appealed eventually up into the court system, into the judiciary, does the judiciary give deference to you all as the regulators that you may have determined yes or no to this question? And. Uh, Again, a very, very important concept that I think that continues to, one, not only be potentially challenged, but at the same time will um, regulations looked at if deference, if the deference um, um, principle is either eliminated or diminished uh, when it comes to matters appealed into the courts. So, so back to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the case itself, um, this organization has been performing services since 2013, and they expressly note on their website that they are not licensed funeral directors. So again, we can all react to that now from a factual standpoint and say, what does that mean? Well, one, they're being truthful. They're not licensed. And are they actually potentially um, suggesting that they are licensed? Well, they will argue, no, we clearly say this on our website, and we tell people that we are not licensed uh, funeral directors as well. So we are not, We this group would say we are not under the control, if you will, of government, but for perhaps a business license or otherwise. So this is a, California, this is a case that will be interpreted under California law. It is in the federal courts, but it's a California law-driven issue. A funeral director prepares for the transportation, burial, and disposal of human remains, and by the way, I think there's a California person on the line or multiple ones. So if any of this is, is inaccurate, please type it in the chat, unmute. Let's get ourselves corrected here. But um, directs and supervises others who perform those functions, maintains an establishment for the transportation, disposition of care uh, uh, or care of human remains, uh, may use connection with his or her name, the words funeral director. And we've already talked about this, this other organization says we are not funeral directors. We are not licensed and must be employed by or be uh, the proprietor of a licensed funeral establishment. So we have a bricks and mortar driven issue um, uh, as an establishment license and we have individual licenses that are also uh, are granted as well. So uh, now we have a funeral director defined and then, and then we have the, uh, the scope of practice itself. Okay, so you all can read this, I don't want to read this all, but but uh, engaging in or conducting or holding themselves out as um, preparing for the transportation or burial, maintaining an establishment, or using a connection, those words of funeral director. Um, we are seeing more and more scope of practice issues challenged legally because of broad issues uh, or broad language used in the statutes themselves. And the best example is, is human medicine. And the practice of medicine is an extremely broad defined term and you might say well gee do physical therapies intrude upon that is there exclusivity in in, uh, in doctors human medicine doctors to do something chiropractic um, or even veterinary medicine for purposes of, of uh, storing and dispensing drugs and otherwise and so um, this this is back to you all as the experts interpret that scope of practice so we have to decide here eventually is is that scope um, being violated for purposes of uh, the, uh, the home funeral um, organization. So in uh, November 2019, the California Board or Bureau, technically Bureau, 
um, issued a notice of citation and fines, yeah, and uh, so therefore they are saying you're engaged in the unlawful or unlicensed practice of uh, of uh, funeral directing, and that you are then subject to potential daily fines or however it's, it's worked out, but in this case it's five thousand dollars per day. Uh, the board claim that, or bureau, excuse me, the bureau claim that Full Circle is improperly holding themselves out and acting as, I probably should have put that in the slide, but in acting as funeral directors and thus they require the license. And so this is a garden variety strict case of is the, are the activities undertaken by Full Circle, do they fall within that scope of practice? Um, apparently some informal negotiations were undertaken and uh, ultimately they, those must have been unsuccessful and I'm giving you the information that I could garner and again if there's more out there please feel free to chime in but no one read too far into this but the point is is that they were unable to resolve it informally so full, full circle eventually requested a formal administrative hearing which they have a right to do uh, and here is where they would be heard in a more formal setting where they could uh, confront those that they were accused. They could present um, witnesses and evidence on their behalf and ultimately let a, let a decision be made. As you can see here, $5,000 a day can add up pretty quickly. So there's a lot at stake for all parties here. Uh, and obviously the Bureau is suggesting the unlicensed practice needs to be stopped for in the interest of public protection. And Full Circle is arguing that uh, they are not engaged in the practices defined. So, um, before the hearing then took place that was requested by Full Circle, following their rights, before that hearing, Full Circle withdrew its request and initiated litigation in federal court. So that will raise a lot of legal issues. We're not going to get into the procedural sides too much, but that's, that, that does um, er, um, 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 confront, if you will, some procedural issues as to whether the, this entity, Full Circle, must exhaust its, its administrative remedies first before they jump into federal court and otherwise. And those were all argued eventually. But the Full Circle here alleged the first and, uh, first and 14th Amendment violations. So these are fundamental rights to free speech under the First Amendment enforced against them through the 14th Amendment by the California Bureau. So um, this becomes now a First Amendment-driven case to say is this a free speech issue that's being infringed upon in an unconstitutional manner or not? Um, and by the way, just quickly, the plaintiffs in this case not only included Full Circle, which engaged in the service, but it included multiple families who were the recipients of those services. So now we have a consumer involved saying, if you take away the rights of Full Circle, we won't get the services we expect. And, um, and so that will add an element of, of consumer perspectives to a matter which will offset some of the economic arguments that could be made against Full Circle about they just want to make money doing this or anything else. So we do have plaintiffs that include both the practicing entity uh, or the business itself plus the recipient of services. So they, these plaintiffs then sought a preliminary injunction preventing the Bureau from enforcing the Practice Act, uh, Act against them pending the outcome of the trial. And that trial ultimately we would be on the merits itself, potentially. And that's where you would get into the nitty gritty of uh, the legal arguments. Uh, a preliminary injunction is an extraordinary remedy. And so you have to overcome some hurdles before you can actually enforce that itself. Uh, and here the, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, yeah. the point, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, Gina Sanchez from the California Cemetery and Funeral Bureau has commented a couple of things in the chat. I'm going to maybe ask you to pause for a moment and let her unmute and speak to a couple of things. Excellent. Appreciate that. Okay. Just give me a minute here. Is my video coming up? There you are. Yep. I see you. You can see me? Okay. I can't see me. So if it's a little funky, I'm sorry. Um, this is I, Gina Sanchez, hi from California. Uh, yeah, I did not know we were gonna be sharing all, all my business here. So um, I appreciate you bringing this up and it has actually been um, informative, I, I appreciate that. I think um, 
what uh, the citation itself was for advertising and that's what the investigation was. And through our investigation, they changed their website to reflect more of advice and, of, uh, and, and, and adding that we are not funeral directors. So it was through our investigation that that website was um, remedied. The citation itself was withdrawn um, due to it was functionally wrong at the time uh, that it was written. So we, that's a whole other story. Um, so really what they're, what they're attacking, they call it as a pre-enforcement saying, like, like you said, I, I agree that the statue is very, oh, there's my camera, um, that the statue is very broad. And that's what they're really fighting is that it's a very broad statute. Um, they do get paid for their services where they go into the home and they, um, at first they were saying that they, do the death certificates, do the, do the transporting the body to the cemetery or the crematory and all that stuff. Um, once we have the discussions, it's now um, advice and they help families do that. So it's, it's that kind of um, fine line that we're really dealing with here. Um, 7615 is definition of a funeral director. 7616 of the Business and Professions Code defines a, excuse me, a funeral establishment and um, that's where it gets even more broad, <laughs> the statute of what, um, of, of what uh, you can do to assist people in, in dealing with that. Um, as far as I know, we can't charge 5,000 a day for unlicensed activity. I'm not quite sure where, where that came from, but the maximum amount of a fine for unlicensed activity is 5,000 for each um, offense. So, um, I just wanted to clarify that. I, I don't I don't know of the law that would allow us to charge five thousand per per day. Um, I mean I guess if they kept operating and we continued to issue separate citations and separate instances of it, but um, in that case we would refer to the district attorney or something along those lines. But yeah, we're we're continuing to go and work through this and really um, define scope and and so that's exactly what we're doing is uh, speech versus conduct and defining scope. So anyone has questions for me or would like to actually see the, the case, it's public document and I can send the link. And thank you, thank you, Gina. And, and sometimes my worst nightmare is somebody's on the line that's the defendant <laughs> in a matter of, so I certainly appreciate it. So if I get anything wrong, you stay right there and unmute and, and help correct me uh, and make sure that we know up-to-date information. Um, and, Absolutely. And, and since she did speak here as well, you know, we learn from matters like this. This is, this is mm -hmm. an issue of, of the importance of, of, of um, a legal issue that can surface. And the conduct versus speech is relatively new, if you will, in, in the, in the uh, um, regulatory arena. And, um, and it does add a, an entirely new layer of legal analysis that comes up. And so I'm sure Gina and her staff and the attorneys are, you know, obviously going to be well aware of how that might apply or perhaps not apply uh, the First Amendment and otherwise. And so, um, so it's, it's good to know you're, you're here. And, uh, and, and now I feel like I'm going to tread even more lightly here. But <laughs> uh, again, we learn from this. This is, this is not a critical issue. Uh, this is not to be critical. It's just an analysis oh. that will provide us with some information. So, so no, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Chime in when, when ready. So, um, <laughs> so, so back to where we were. So we have a preliminary injunction and that's just an extraordinary remedy whereby uh, a party would say court do something today. Uh, and then pending the outcome of a trial on the merits somewhere down the road. And uh, you have to overcome quite a few issues in order to have that preliminary injunction um, entered. Uh, and the defendants in this case, the, the board, the bureau, um, filed a motion to dismiss. So now we have kind of competing procedural issues. So, so as emphasized in the middle of the slide up there, there's no ruling on the merits. Okay. So nothing has been decided yet as to first amendment, this or scope of practice that and where they may collide, uh, related to, and ultimately be determined conduct versus speech. So that likely will come somewhere down the road unless there is a resolution in advance. And, and in many times in cases like this, there is a resolution in advance as well. So, um, so we will look forward to future issues on this. Um, the, uh, the, uh, very quickly I have some procedural issues. This is legal nuts and bolts, but I just wanted to touch upon the bullets that are up there. The court held that the plaintiffs in this case 
we're not required to exhaust the administrative approach because of the fundamental nature of the rights at stake, free speech, First Amendment. Uh, it also ruled that the plaintiffs had standing to sue, so they, uh, they were able to um, assert their rights and that the matter was right for adjudication, even though nothing had been finalized yet from the standpoint of, of the uh, citation and fines, and that ultimately the court did have subject matter jurisdiction to hear the case uh, based on a lot of those factors that you have up there, that we have up there. Uh, and then lastly, the Bureau is not entitled to the dismissal, which would be a procedural issue. So again, it still is pending, um, but it's pending from uh, an issue on the merits. Um, the elements of a preliminary injunction involve likelihood of success on the merits, irreparable harm, and public interest and balance of equities. This is how a court will look at something that says, should we decide it today and, and have a matter procedurally um, ruled upon pending the merits case somewhere down the road. And we all know litigation takes a lot of time. So the merits of this case may not, may not be determined for you know, months, perhaps longer as well. So they, they went through that argument itself and some of those issues. And the court found in favor, and here, Gene, I'll rely on you again to make sure this is current, found in favor of the plaintiffs and enjoined the Bureau from enforcing the act pending the outcome of the trial itself. Um, interestingly, the court, in the opinion itself, um, and again, this is from December 29th of 2020, and it is the United States District Court for the Eastern District of California, said that the Bureau did not identify any government interest or explain why the administrative action does not burden more speech than necessary to further an important issue. That's that fourth element of uh, least restrictive means. Uh, uh, under, uh, under uh, 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 yeah, I forgot. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, um, so uh, um, the uh, uh, issue now of of uh, of, uh, of ruling upon this on the merits will eventually surface and come forth. Uh, and as I mentioned, that may be a while. But the lesson to be learned that I got out of this, and again, with Gina's help, it's, it helps me to have more information. But the lesson that I've learned from this is is understanding how the First Amendment might have to be argued. And that we as lawyers on behalf of the regulatory community or your state boards themselves must understand that, that, that four-pronged strict scrutiny test we talked about and make sure we address this issue of, of least restrictive means. Because if speech is going to be viewed under the First Amendment, if, if the, the actions of, of, a, of an entity or a person are going to be viewed under, that, that strict, under the First Amendment, that strict scrutiny will apply and we have to make sure that we are very clear about the, uh, the importance of the restrictions that are had in order to protect the public themselves. And so lots of words, lots of things that went on in this case uh, and that will ultimately go on as well. Uh, Gene is here to help clarify as well. And thank you for those comments uh, that exist. And uh, gee, while, while we've got somebody else, uh, or while we've got uh, boards on the line here as well, and I'm looking at your attendance list. If anybody here is from Arizona, I think they are. Yeah. So Arizona, feel free, feel free to chime in as well on this one. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about this, but I encourage everyone to read occasionally a, a sunset review re report or audit from outside of your jurisdiction. It can be very, very enlightening. Um, in November of 2020, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Performance Audit and Sunset Review Commission, I think they are in Arizona, issued its report on the Arizona Board of Funeral Directors and the Bombers. And uh, again, this is not a critical issue. I'm not being critical of them, but these are great documents to identify where there may need to be improvements. Okay. And I view sunset reports, by the way, as extremely um, beneficial to the regulatory community. Okay. If it identifies something that's not working well, fine. It gives you areas to correct. If it identifies where things are working very well, it gives us something to look to to try to improve our ability to enforce the practice acts within any of the jurisdictions themselves. And so for those on the line here that don't know what Sunset Review is, um, there are various ways there, but it should be set forth in statute. And occasionally uh, um, your board is under some kind of a review in order to maintain the fact that the profession should continue to be licensed, okay? And so sunset reviews are, can be extremely important to say, 
Um, if a board isn't doing its job or if it's not working well, perhaps legislative changes are made all the way up to including deregulating a profession. Okay, so these sunset reviews can be very important. Now, uh, you can see the purpose of the Arizona audit to determine whether the board issued licenses to individuals and businesses in the funeral industry in accordance with statute and rule requirements. You all should be thinking like that every single day, every single board meeting, administrators and staff on the line every day, board members every month or whenever it is that you meet. Are you undertaking matters in accordance with the law? And that law can be a statute enacted by the legislature. It can be a rule promulgated by the board or a combination of the two. Continuing to read uh, whether they can, uh, conducted funeral establishment and crematory inspections as required. So if you all have a requirement to conduct inspections or audits or reviews as part of either renewal or periodic um, physical on-site inspections and visits, make sure you know what they say and follow whatever it is they are. And if you don't, you may be subject to some criticism, either in an audit report or otherwise. And, uh, and whether the board provided uh, responses to the statutory sunset factors. So if there are factors within your law, know what they are and, uh, and obviously follow them. Now, I will add to this that in my opinion, whether you're under a sunset um, statute or not, act like you are, okay? Hold your meetings, robust minutes, provide reports or annual reports and otherwise. And so kind of while I'm on that topic, if I may, and I know we're going to run out of time in just a few minutes, but um, invite people to your meetings. Let them see you in action. The regulatory community operates behind closed doors. No one really knows what it does. Sometimes I wonder if even the boards know what they do. And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, in part, so invite people to your meetings. I would send a letter to the governor's office before every meeting and say, here's the tax agenda and we invite you to attend and see what it is we do. And when the governor does not attend, which the governor probably won't, um, follow it up with a, a post letter with an attached, with the minutes attached, once those minutes are approved, by the way. And that means what? It's gonna keep you writing um, accurate minutes that reflect what it is the board did. And I read a lot of minutes from board meetings, and sometimes, you know, they need to be improved a bit. And I'm not speaking Arizona, by the way. I'm speaking now generally. Um, and so if you're going to follow this, um, certainly uh, um, um, write robust board minutes. And there's an art to that. doesn't mean you're going to write down everything that everybody says and everything else. But when an outsider reads it, they should know what it is the board, what it is the board does and did at that meeting itself. Um, and there are other ways to, again, I think, prepare for these sunset reviews, whether you're going to fall under them or not. So if you do this issue of keeping accurate records and robust minutes, it's easier to comply with sunset and audit issues that come up. And even if you're not under a sunset, I would attach the board minutes to, a, to some kind of a report and send it to the executive branch, the gov governor's office, or whomever, the appointing authorities, and say, look, what, here's what we did in the year 2020. And uh, we did a great job at it. And promote yourselves so that the community has an understanding of what it is that you do, whether they're the appointing authority, the legislatures, the media, the academic community, or the consumers themselves. We need to be proud of what regulators do, and we need to showcase that to some degree at the same time understanding that we might be under a sunset review as well. So in Arizona, they have some key findings and recommendations. I'm not going to go into those, but everyone should read sunset reports from not only your state, but others. And by the way, if you can't find any, contact me or contact the conference staff, and we can direct you to them. And you may want to read a sunset report outside of the funeral industry. It may be in vet medicine. It may be in human medicine. It may be in mental health. It may be others. And so these can be very instructive to ensure that we as boards um, perform as we should and that we invite the scrutiny rather than shy away from it. Last couple of slides here, um, COVID issues. We, we can't leave a legal issue without talking a little bit about COVID and we will discuss this a little bit more as well uh, in, uh, in the session to follow today and the next session about complaints and perhaps a little bit tomorrow as well. But 
Um, as we know, there are executive orders all over the place, more executive orders than we've ever seen in, in, in the history of anything that I've researched, at least. And, and it's driven by COVID and the reaction to and, um, and everything that's happening. Um, there are thousands of executive orders and there are websites where you can find them. Um, and these are at the state level, by the way, state-driven, governor-issued exec, uh, executive orders. And there seemingly are thousands of lawsuits that are challenging these. This pandemic has gone on long enough where likely, in my opinion, almost every executive order that is going to be granted in the future is outside the bounds of separation of powers. We have a legislative branch that enacts laws. We have an executive branch that enforces laws, judicial branch interprets. And um, this has gone on long enough where the legislatures have time to meet and address these issues. And that's a lot of what the litigation is about. We don't need to get into the details of it, but ultimately some of these issues may be struck down. This is an example of, of the state of Michigan and uh, Governor Whitmer's executive orders basically being struck down because the court ruled that the governor doesn't have the right to continue to effectuate an emergency declaration and then issue order executive orders um, to dictate what can and cannot happen in, the bus in a business sense. And so here in Illinois, um, our governor every 30 days renews the emergency order and continues to issue executive orders. Is that the appropriate way? It may or may not be. But the point of all this is this COVID is changing issues related to the legal, um, uh, the legal aspects that, that do come up. Um, tomorrow in the board training, we're going to cover a little bit more about COVID and a little bit more detail about some of these that, that exist as well. But uh, Lauren, any other comments or questions that are coming up? And the reason I tease you with tomorrow is to get you all to come tomorrow. So we have uh, um, some of those opportunities as well, because my next slide is, is, the, uh, is the big thank you slide as well. But uh, let's uh, identify if there are any questions or and make sure Gina is still with us. Gina, am I we okay with everything I said? So. I don't see any other comments, Dale. Um, Arizona is on if they have anything that they want to add. Uh, other than that, the link that Gina referred to, some of you have inquired about that, and she is going to go ahead and get that to us. She's trying to locate you now. Uh, there's Gina. Is safely she, Dale, is the executive director of the Arizona Board of Funeral Directors in Obama. Excellent. Hey, Dale. Hey, Hey, I didn't I want to take up too much of your time, but just, just to um, enlighten everybody just a little bit on that. The auditors, it was an interesting experience going through the sunset audit. They ultimately did recommend that the board be continued, that it would affect the health and safety and welfare of the public if we weren't here. So that's a big yay. Um, that particular slide that you showed, um, this was, so I wasn't with the board for the previous sunset audit. Um, Everything that they claimed we weren't properly vetting uh, before licensure with establishments, it was that you say you already owned an establishment and a percentage of the ownership changed or, or it, it was sold, but it was still there. We didn't always go out and reinspect that establishment. And so because it was technically a new license, we had to always inspect. So that was one thing they brought to our attention and uh, Jean Besson. And then with the individuals, again, if you really read the law, every time somebody applies for a license, you're supposed, we're supposed to collect a fingerprint card and charge them and run their fingerprints for a background check. Um, how the board had been handling it when I walked in and I didn't see an issue with it that I should have, I guess, is that if you're already holding, say, your intern license and now you're applying to be an embalmer, we had to run your prints again. And, and their argument was, well, you're not protecting the health if you don't run the prints every single time. So say you're holding an active embalmer license and now you want to be a cremationist, we should run those prints, which to me seemed overburdensome when they, when they were explaining it like that. And I said, well, if your point is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, I could have been licensed in 1976 and renewed every year and we have no statutory authority to redo your background check. So that's something that needs to be looked at. But nonetheless, the report looks like we, we weren't vetting or, or checking anybody. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Excellent. And, uh, and uh, 
you know, again, these, these sunset um, reports or reviews or audits, whatever they're called in your jurisdictions, um, basically will never find that the board is perfect and doing everything they should. So you get used to this. And if there needs to be improvement, that's okay. You take advantage of that, especially ultimately, as Judith said, they, they recommended that the regulation continue, which is fine. And so this is why I'm suggesting you read these reports and say, oh, wow, do we do that or not do that? And we all learn from each other. So um, so I, I bring up the California case. I bring up the Arizona issue so we can learn from it. That's all. And uh, so, again, thank you, Judith, for some of those details. Uh, as I mentioned, it's always um, uh, nerve wracking to know somebody's on the line that can give me more details and everything else. And so I try to be as, obviously as accurate as possible. So um, okay, and, uh, thank you, Dale. And to end with a, a little story related to that as well, by the way, is, is um, I used to pick out funny cases that I thought may had nothing to do with regulation, and I would just um, get the audience involved in, in legal issues by bringing up a funny case. And, uh, and this is a live presentation in front of an audience as opposed to virtual like this. And uh, someone had wanted to change their name to Santa Claus. Okay? And it went all the way up to, to a state Supreme Court. I will leave the state out. Of this, and I brought that case up just to bring light to a case, try to make people laugh and get us all warmed up to legal issues. And a hand shot up in the back and about the case, and I didn't talk much about it other than to, you know, just to bring it up. And and um, and the person said, "That's my brother-in-law," and so they told us all about the case from the audience as well. And so I've learned to uh, make sure I defer to anybody in the audience who wants to talk about any of the cases I bring up. So, so um, in conclusion, here now. Um, not too many cases have matriculated into the court system. It's good and bad. Um, and uh, that conduct versus speech, extremely important. We keep an eye on that issue, learn a little bit more about it in the First Amendment. The audit bringing up, again, so we keep an eye on them, read them, and learn from them as well. And, uh, and uh, people like Judith can talk about it. The process and the content that came out of it can be extremely important. So Hopefully the last uh, uh, 60 minutes here has been enlightening to everyone um, related to some of the legal issues and the trends that are out there. We will talk more about some of these issues in the board training tomorrow, very little overlap, and then with some of the legislative updates tomorrow afternoon as well. But uh, Charles, I will turn it back to you with a big thank you for, uh, for you, for what you do, and uh, your presiding over this meeting, and to everyone on the line for what's the important role you play in public protection as well. Thank you, Dale, and thank you once again for a wonder, wonderful um, session there on legal updates in 2021 and the do's and don'ts. And I will attest to you because I am a Sunset Board uh, agency that it works. Um, I do not see the Sunset Committee as a, uh, some people view them as the enemy. However, if I'm doing something wrong, when they point it out to me and give me the opportunity to be corrected, it just makes us all better. So. Uh, I really agree with your uh, comments that the Sun Sunset Committee. But thank you for all that you do. Um, at this time, we're moving right along. 